private journey. And uh, as I said, maybe things in the last decade or so will be covered by somebody else later. So we move on. And uh, next talk is by Professor R.G. Pillay. He is going to be talking about the accelerated developments. So he joined TRPR in 1974. In the previous talk, you already have heard his uh, name referred to many times. Okay. So his uh, research interests span many areas of physics, covering nuclear physics, accelerator physics, condensed matter physics, and material science. He set up the first national high purity germanium based high speed spectrometer for nuclear structure studies at TFR and has played a major role in development of heavy ion superconducting LINAC accelerator at BRC TFR Pelletron LINAC facility. So he was awarded IPM Murli M. Chobani Award in 2016 and was awarded prestigious DAE BRNS Raja Ramana Fellowship. So, so I'll tell you also after 40 minutes. Or you want a half time? No, no half time. So Nagarjan has made my life somewhat easy. Uh, so, so I'll try to tell you something about the accelerated development from the history that backward that I can trace up to that I am familiar with. Okay. <clears throat> of course, it all culminated in the present accelerator facility that we have. So I'll describe that also to a somewhat of a detail. So not working. Let's take a second. This is not working. Yeah. This is not working. Ah, it's working. Okay. So the earliest accelerator in TIFR, ah, sorry, yeah, okay. ah, was the cascade generator. It's a 1 million volt open air machine. Okay. And this was installed in this campus in the year 1953-1954. Okay. So the building was still under construction. But during those days, we didn't have to wait for any occupation certificate so as the buildings were being built you could actually quietly occupy and put your equipment into place okay so so this was actually installed in 53 54 so it's a proton machine basically so 1 million volts so it, the cascade hall which we is still present it was installed in the cast so it was an open air 1 million volt and accelerating protons okay the ad advantage of the proton is that if you hit on light elements you'll actually make neutrons if you have a new nuclear reaction. And you could get a spectrum of broad energy spectrum of neutrons, or you could get monoenergetic neutrons. So that is also relevant from the DAE fission programs and other. So the neutrons was also, new, physics with neutrons also was being done. And that is also, so, so, so the nuclear reactions group, okay, at that time there are two groups, nuclear spectroscopy group, which Nagarajan mentioned. So that was headed by Professor Thoser, and I was part of nuclear spectroscopy group. And all of us registered with Thoser. So Kuruk was the last student who was registered with Thoser. But by the time my turn came to register with Thoser, he was on the way out. He was retiring. So I had I was the first person who had to register with somebody other than Thoser. So, so the, the nuclear reactions group was headed by another gentleman called SK Bhattacharji. Okay. And and that was an independent thing, and they always they use the uh, uh, cascade generator. <clears throat> okay, so they also dabbled at some point into condensed matter physics and so on, but not everybody. Mostly, so there the last person who did his PhD on the cascade generator was Amit Roy. Hmm. Amit Roy and Deepan Barja. These two people were the last to use that machine. Okay, and then it was dismantled, and and then donated to Calicut University. I've seen this machine in Calicut University; it still exists. But it's too difficult and too expensive to keep it turning on. The people who took it made turned it on and used it, but those people have also retired. So now it's just a museum piece there. <clears throat> like, so, so it had a relevance to the DAE program. Huh. And Raja Raman was also part of the nuclear reactions group when he joined, because he joined TIF, but he didn't BRC did not exist at that time. It was probably just coming up. <clears throat> so that was the origin of the first accelerator. So, so SK Bhattacharya was the nuclear reactions uh, group head and Thoser was the spectroscopy group head. So, 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 so starting with this machine, at some point when uh, in the 60s, Bhavan had decided that you should also go in for other uh, heavier, ion, uh, heavier energies. So, so one proposal was to make uh, the variable energy cyclotron at Calcutta and uh, associated with this was a proposal to buy a heavy ion machine to be installed in Bombay. Now, where exactly by the TIFR or the BRC, it ended up being at TIFR. Okay, so, so these things were actually envisaged by Baba 
in the 60s. And in the 60s, the uh, VCC was being made, homemade. And this was not, so, and then we had to buy the machine. So because it was to buy the machine, it became got very delayed and we could do it only in the 80s. So it, uh, so the Peloton came in the 80s. So I'll describe that a little later. Okay. <clears throat> so, so this machine, once it was dismantled, and sent off, then we built the Pelotron adjacent to the Cascade Hall, and the Cascade Hall became the user beam hall for the Pelotron. So, so it, both the things are adjacent and in one corner of the Institute. <laughs> Apart from uh, this activity, okay, there was also a micro engineering group, and they also built machines, but they built electron machines. Okay, So in the basement, this is one machine which was built by Professor R.V. Sitaram, R.V.S. Sitaram. Okay? Hmm. So, so this is a 3 MV electron linac. Huh. And then once they made this demonstration piece, then they started making compact machines and selling uh, selling it and actually initially not selling it, just giving it away. Okay. So the first machine they made was actually for, uh, uh, was sent to VCC to Trivandrum for, for doing uh, materials analysis using the X-rays for the electron is you use it on a target and make drum swelling x-rays and it's a very powerful x-ray source and you use it for looking at metallic components and all that which you make to do metal uh, to radiography of these things so that was one of the earliest machine the second machine which they made was a medical LDNAC, and that was in pgi chandigarh okay subsequently they are shifted out of tifr and then they actually make these machines and give it to many many places all over india okay but they're not very good at commercializing it. So they're able to compete with variants and other places, uh, but then they, they make actually good machines. Okay. So this is just another development which is happening in TIFR, uh, in the basement, in the auditorium basement labs, but well hidden from everybody. So let me come to the Peloton. So, so once the, the project was envisaged that we should buy a machine, uh, and then during those days, foreign exchange also was limited. And then, so, so, and BNC was always under some kind of sanction. So, so it, it was decided that we keep it in TIFR. Okay. So, this is how it started. There was another machine at, at BRC of Antigraph, which was already there, which was a 5 MV machine. Okay. <clears throat> so, the Peloton actually is a Vandigraph itself. It's actually a design which is basically based on a Vandigraph. But the Vandigraph, when it was designed, Use the rubber or the insulating charging belt to make the high voltage. This was what the design was. Okay, so that was the breakthrough came from a person called Professor Herb at Wisconsin. So he changed this rubber belt by using a nylon rope with metal beads on it. So he just made a mala of metal beads on a nylon rope, and you charge the beads. Don't charge the nylon. Okay, you go and charge an insulator. It is anyway bound to fail on you. Okay, so as soon as you charge the beads, then the the charge which you de deliver to the high voltage uh, deck, okay, it becomes very stable and also larger in uh, value. So you could actually make machines and you could break through a regime of of the order of million volts, which was what the Van de Graaff could do, to of the order of ten million volts. Okay, of course this technology also could not be upscaled too much. So if people wanted to make twenty million volt machines. It wouldn't operate at 20 million volts. Okay. So 14 million volts turns out to be an optimum. If you design for 14, it get, you get 14. If you design for 10, actually, you can get 12. But if you design for 20, you will have to struggle to get 18. Hmm. So 14 was optimum for this particular uh, technology. So we went in for a 14 million volts. Okay. So this project was approved in the 70s. Okay. Though envisaged in the 60s. And then later, it got sort of commissioned and built in the 80s. Okay. So, so today, of course, it is no longer a rope with beads looking like a mala. It's a proper chain hmm, with links, which are metal links, and uh, uh, bushings, which are nylon. Okay. And this whole thing is made very flexible. And then that's how the charge, charging system works. Okay. So it's a, it's a modified Van de Graaff generator. Okay. Hmm. And so because of this system of steel pellets, which goes around, it derives its name and it's called the Peletron. So the Peletron is nothing but the charging system. Name is derived from the charging system. Of course, people used to tease me and call this also the Peletron <laughs> at times. Hmm. Okay. So this project, when it was proposed, it was six people, three from BRC and three from uh, TIFR. So Sharmaji, Devare, SK Mitra. Hmm. 
and MK Mehta, Kapoor, and Baba who was then at BRC. Baba was actually the first training school batch, huh? but he always worked with SK uh, Bhattacharya at TIFR. Okay, so when this project got finally approved, he shifted to TIFR permanently, though he was always working in TIFR, but he was actually a member of BRC. So he shifted to TIFR permanently. So it became, at some point, it became four versus four versus two. <clears throat> okay, but when this project was up <clears throat> and we saw, it was already clear to us at that time that the 14 million units for doing nuclear physics had to be extended. So we had already thought of, these people had already thought of that they will actually add to this machine a superconducting Linac booster, a heavy ion Linac booster. And there were only two of the kind which were being made at that time in the world. Okay, It was still under construction. So they said that we should adopt that technology and make it. Okay, So this was already envisaged. Okay, So, so, when, this was, so when this project was executed, they already made a hall for us to put the Linac in. Of course, they didn't they had no clue what the Linac would look like. I'll show you the hall later. It was a miserable hall, but then we managed to fit something in. <clears throat> yeah. So this was the era in which it was uh, done. So this is PK Ayengar was director BRC and Sri Kantan was director TIFR. So this is so right now, at that point of time, all this was just vacant land. So the and then it slowly became the accelerator building and that so you had the tower you also had a lab block and it was linked to the cascade hall so that the cascade hall could be used as a beam hall and then there was a mirror uh, hall on the built on the other side on the casualina side which was designed to house the linac as and when it came okay well so apart from that infrastructure of all the buildings the project also provided a new air conditioning unit for the tifr a new substation for tifr so all that was bonus for tifr so it was inaugurated, it took nearly eight years to commission the machine. So it was inaugurated, and by then the director had changed, it had become V-Sync, okay? The chairman had changed, it had become uh, uh, MR Srinivasan. <clears throat> so, so once it was inaugurated, the users started using it. So essentially from 89, it was in use, because December 30th, it was inaugurated. Okay, this is how the accelerator looks if you go inside the tank, okay? So you actually see sections which are one one million volt sections, and there are fourteen such live sections. Hmm. But since the accelerator is very tall, you also need to focus the beam and do diagnostics en route. So you also have a dead section. So you actually have fifteen sections on each side, out of which fourteen are live and one is dead. Hmm. No voltage across it. Hmm. <clears throat> and the machine, as received in the eighties, today is actually quite different inside. So many things inside have also got changed. Okay. <clears throat> So this is just a cutaway view of the building. So you start with the negative uh, ions, accelerate towards the 14 million volts, which is in the middle. And then you, when you're in the middle of the terminal, you get rid of the electrons by going through a foil. So the negative ion becomes a highly charged positive ion. And since the atom is already more, the ion is already quite fast, most of the light elements up to oxygen, you can actually get fully stripped. So you can get eight plus or the carbon six plus and things like that. Okay, and and that is reaccelerated in this in the second half of the machine. Okay, so this is actually the same. The voltage is used twice. It's called a tandem accelerator, and and because of the trick of stripping it once it is already fast enough, and getting a highly charged ion on the way out, you actually get a much bigger utilization of the voltage than you would have just done if they stuck the ion source inside the voltage here in the terminal. Okay, and once you come down, you take the beam and give it to the cascade hall for using it for experiments or shoot it into the superconducting Linux site. So, so this was also in which since it was envisaged, this magnet was also designed and purchased in that fashion. It's it so it can switch the beam in either of the two directions. Okay, so the next job was to build a superconducting Linux. Okay, so by then, Kurup and me had finished PhD, so the job was done for us. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so, okay, maybe this sentence should come first. Hmm. Okay, hmm. so so this was a project again jointly proposed by BRC and TIFR. Okay, so from TIFR side there was Professor Devare and Professor Sharma, uh, and from the BRC side it was VS Ramurthy and Dr. Kapoor. So this was the team which proposed the thing. Since we had just finished our PhD uh, and just uh, employed in the institute as uh, probably we were just RAs at that time. We were not even fellows. Hmm. Okay, so. <laughs> 
So we were too, too small of right to be part of this senior gang, to be part of the project. Hmm. So the dirty work was dumped on us. Huh. And we started with a very small number of people. Both of us went for a, a sabbatic, uh, not, not for a postdoc at Stony Brook. So Stony Brook was one of the labs which was building us a Linac booster, superconducting Linac booster. And there was another uh, booster which was being built at Argonne National Lab. So these were the two projects internationally which were doing, they were building a machine for heavy ions. Okay. <clears throat> so we went there to learn what, what they are doing and see it and then come back and implement it. Hmm. So, so let me go back to the thing. Hmm. So how do you build a Linux for heavy ions? Okay. For an electron, it was very easy because the electron is very light. So a little kick and it's relativistic. Okay. And once it's relativistic, it's traveling at close to velocity of light. Uh, and so, so if you have a uh, radiation RF field, okay. So the RF field is also traveling at velocity of light. So the only job is to sit on the crest and ride with the wave. So your energy is transported. You, the electron gets accelerated by you sitting and riding on the wave. And you are at velocity light. The wave is at velocity light. No problems. Okay. But as soon as it becomes a heavy ion, okay, hmm. then you, you can never synchronize yourself with the electromagnetic wave. So the, then, so the next best thing we do is build a cavity and put a standing wave inside the cavity. Okay. And once you have a standing wave inside the cavity, so you charge the two faces of a pillbox. So this will be positive and this will be, oops, sorry. Hmm. So this will be positive and this is negative in one half cycle. And in the other half cycle, the charges transfer themselves to the other side and this negative comes here, positive goes there. So current is flowing up and down on the walls of the cavity and the faces get charged back and forth. Okay. Hmm. So, so when, the when, the, when the voltage is in the right direction, okay, the voltage, the electric field is positive and it's in the opposite direction is negative. So you have to, first thing is, this is not a DC machine. It becomes an AC machine. And pulses or pulse of beam can be accelerated if it arrives at the crest when it is in the cavity. Okay, And you don't send beam at the rest of the time. Okay, So you send beam only in a burst. And that burst you synchronize with the crest. Okay, So it gets accelerated. But once it gets accelerated, it should now be synchronous when you come to the next cavity. But since the next cavity is an independent cavity, I can always time the RF field in the cavity to time with the arrival of the bunch. So, so a sequence of such independent cavities make an accelerator. That's basically the trick. Okay. So you don't have to worry about synchronization of yourself riding a wave because you should be on the same velocity at the wave. You don't care. Now you can, you, you come at whatever velocity you come. I can synchronize from one cavity to the next cavity independently. Okay. So this is basically the trick that we do. The other thing is that if you want a sizable electric field so that it behaves like a decent accelerator, Okay, then the charging currents to make this voltage also becomes very high. Okay, so the so the cavities actually dissipate a lot of electrical energy. Okay, and this dissipation also you can overcome if you make it superconducting. Okay, so that's basically one of the leap in technology. You make it cavities and you also make it superconducting. Okay, and this is what was the thing that we envisaged. And the particles which we are accelerating, since they're heavy ions in the periodic table. Okay, the typical energy per mass number, that is MeV per nucleon, which you're interested, is in this pocket, 5 to 10 MeV per nucleon. Okay, and this was the number which comes from do it, uh, wanting to do nuclear physics. Okay, so if anything is lower, then you will now be able to overcome the repulsive force between two nucleus. Okay, so, so you have to be in this pocket. So this is roughly of the Coulomb uh, repulsion that you see when you two nuclei try to come to each other. Okay. So that's roughly the, that pocket of energy. That's when you do nuclear physics. If you are much higher than that energy, then you smash the uh, two nucleus and you get rubbish out of it. Okay, so then that's not nuclear physics. Okay, so so we leave it to other people to do that. Hmm. So 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 basically, so this is the energy which is interest, and this at this energy, the particles are of the order of ten percent velocity of light. Just for an information. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So 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 we built the Linac. We had to put it in the hall which already was built for us. Okay. Huh. Oh, so I will show that hall. So, so this, so, so the Linac, if you expand the word Linac, it means linear accelerator. Okay. Now, the hall which was built for us, we couldn't put the machine in a linear manner because if we had done that, we would have hit the C. Hmm. So, we had to build a bend in the middle of the, of the Linac, and that actually complicated life quite a bit. Hmm. So, so I'll just show you an exploded view of the Linac hall. Hmm. So it's a 15 meter by 15 meter hall. Everywhere it is one meter thick, excepting in that tunnel which connects to the electron. 
where it is 1.5 mm, 1.5 meters thick. And since the hole is already a given hole, we have to fit the machine to the maximum capability. So we have to come in, take a kink towards the outer corner, and then bend back towards this. So we have to have a bend. And if you see the bend, it's also a complicated bend. It has multiple elements in it. And it occupies a quite a sizable surface area of the hall. Okay. So the LINAC, we could put only four accelerating modules here and three accelerating modules here. We have one more crash set here, which we call the buncher. I'll describe that as we go along. <clears throat> and then all the cryogenic system, which cools the entire LINAC, is kept in the middle of the hall. Okay. This is what is a cavity. This cavity was designed at Stony Brook. And you plate lead on this cavity. Okay. Now, lead is one superconductor, or a elemental superconductor, which is superconducting at 4.2 at 4 Kelvin, because this TC of the lead is 7.2 Kelvin. The other uh, element which we could have used was niobium, whose TC is 9.2 Kelvin, and that was being built at Argonne National. Niobium was a tougher technology. Okay, so, so between the lead technology, which is just electroplated, and the niobium, which had required much more complicated uh, uh, business to uh, machine and uh, weld and join and so on. Okay, that we said we will not enter into. But Delhi, uh, IUSC Delhi, when they built their accelerator, they collaborated with uh, Argonne National Lab and went in for niobium technology. Okay, but they took them longer to master that technology. So we took, we thought the lead would be simpler and we went stuck to the lead technology. It turns out it doesn't matter. Uh, whichever you choose. Uh, but today, if somebody builds an accelerator, they will not build it with lead on copper. They will build it with niobium. <coughs> yeah. So so this was the thing. So, so, so this cavities was designed in uh, uh, Stony Brook. Okay? But we had to adopt that design for our uh, purposes at, to be made locally. This material could not be bought, made in, uh, was not made in India. So this had to be imported from Japan. Okay, and all in during those period we were still under heavy sanctions, so that also we had to struggle to get the high purity copper material. Okay, so we could not get it from Europe or anything. We had to get it from, uh, so we got it from Japan, <coughs> and and a lot of this machining also had to be done at BRC, and they also had to learn how to handle this copper. So the very high purity copper is actually extremely soft. So if you scratch it with your nail, it'll get scratched. Okay, so if you want to hold it in a lathe to machine it. Huh. If you see on a workshop, he will put it in the lathe and he'll crunch it till it is tight. But it is, the copper is soft, so it will keep oozing and oozing. So the more he crunches, the more it will ooze. Okay? So it was, it was, so even the workshop people had to learn how to handle such a soft material and do machining. And similarly, if you're trying to do a machining on a soft material, it behaves like chewing gum. So you want to cut something on a chewing gum. It doesn't work. It'll come out with rough and um, miserable. Okay? So everything had to be over the learning process. Huh. So the welding copper is even tougher because it's a very good conductor of heat. So if you try to heat, melt it, it will refuse to melt. And when it melts, it will boil like milk. Huh. So it will splatter everywhere. So even welding copper is a trick which we had to learn. Okay? So most of our failures in this cavity making was actually due to the welding. Okay? But we had to learn, we had to, we never threw away anything. So once it came from the BRC workshop, quietly take it into TNFR and do something and make it work. Hmm. I will not explain what we do, but then we used to do something and make it work. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so this, so, so why superconductivity? Do we really gain, or it is just a fancy way of doing it? Okay. If you go from room temperature to liquid helium, of course you have many other cryogenic steps which you could have also used, but there are no decent superconductors there. Hmm. Okay. And as Narvajan mentioned, you have these ITC superconductors, which actually, in principle, could have been used nitrogen and above. Of course, it, it was not yet invented when we were uh, doing this. Okay, but even today, a high temperature superconductor is unfit for using in accelerators. Okay, it's a dirty superconductor. Okay, because why? I'll explain. So, so, so the two superconductors which are useful to us is only lead and niobium. So the DC resistance goes to zero. Okay, so one, so any of these one, two, three compounds or bismuth compounds and all that, they all will go to DC will be zero. Okay, but AC resistance is never zero because the, because when the RF is uh, oscillating, the electrons have to know which direction to go. They can't be just going in any direction they like. So the electric field and the current density have to be parallel in some sense. There's a non-zero. It is not that the electric field and the uh, is zero, 
and the current density is present. So because you have to, I, I have to change direction. So the current has to follow the sense of the electric field. So E dot J is never zero. Okay, so, so that is why this uh, uh, has some kind of a uh, resistance. Of course, if we compare it with copper, the surface resistance of copper at a typical RF field, RF frequency will be of the order of 10 milli ohms. Uh, whereas in the case of niobium or in the case of lead, they'll be nano ohms. So there is a huge gain hmm, in the surface resistance. Okay, so the loss becomes very, very small. Okay, so that's the advantage that we go, we go use in when you go to superconducting. Hmm. So if you look at uh, uh, the cavities which we make, okay, if we made it out of niobium and compared it with something which we make out of copper, okay, for the same accelerating field, suppose I want half a million volts per charge state of acceleration in each cavity, then it will cost me fifty kilowatt of RF energy per cavity. It'll be a, it'll be an all India radio station per cavity. Huh. Okay. Hmm. Whereas if I make it with lead, it will cost me only five watts. Uh, lead being a slightly inferior of the two families of lead and niobium. If I made it out of niobium, it would have costed me only half a watt. Okay. So the electrical energy which I use to power up the cavities grows down tremendously by a factor of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5. Okay. Compared to copper. Okay. And also copper, if I want to make half a megavolts per uh, charge state, it will cost me a lot of energy, but I can't even make a cavity to, uh, operate at that uh, electric field hmm. because it will melt. So I'll have, to have to, I'll have to distribute it over many, many cavities so that the power is distributed over many cavities. Okay. Hmm. So, so the cavity, so the once I go superconducting, one gains on the real estate because the cavities go to higher electric fields. So I can make the whole Linux smaller and compactly, and the whole machine is compact. Okay. Hmm. But there is a there is something which you pay for. You have to go cold, okay. And to go cold, you have to make a refrigerator which is operating at four Kelvin, okay. So, but then the room temperature is three hundred Kelvin. So this ratio is seventy five. So Carnap tells us that the ratio is seventy five. So for every one watt, I should get I should use only seventy five watts in the line power. It doesn't work. We typically use seven fifty watts in the line power. So it's like one in thousand huh, rather than one in seventy five. Hmm. So, but but this is only one in thousand. But I gained one in ten to the four to one to the ten to the five. So the overall, I am also extremely energy efficient when I go superconducting. So I make a smaller machine, and it's also energy efficient. This is basically the trick of going superconducting. Hmm. There is this pain of keeping everything cold. So when we started, I didn't put include that picture. When we started, we actually the LTF when they shifted from the fourteen ten, which was a chota machine, to sixteen twenty, which was a bigger machine when they bought. Okay, but 1410, we didn't throw it away. We took it to the Linux and we tested everything with the 1410 and then we discarded it before we bought our own machine. <clears throat> okay, so four such cavities make one module. So we use four such lead plated cavities become go into one module and we have seven accelerating modules and each cavity is capable of giving us, as per the design, half a megavolt per charge state. So each cryostat gives us two megavolts per charge state. And if you have seven modules, we get an additional 14 megavolts per charge state. So we actually double the energy of the pelotron. Okay. On a good day, we can actually triple it because then the charge state coming from the pelotron also can be increased by stripping the more electrons off the heavy ion. Okay. So, so it can be double to triple the energy that comes out from the pelotron. Okay. So and that is that was sufficient to do interesting physics up to the uh, the range of uh, heavy ions that we were interested in. Okay. So, so once these cavities are put into place, the next step is how do I accelerate a bunched beam through these cavities? I, so I have to first do a bunching. Okay. So I'll just explain that which you do. So, so this is a different kind of a cavity which we got from Stony Brook. Okay. Actually, we bought it from the persons who sold it to Stony Brook. Okay, so if you look at the hall, this is a 15 cross 15 meter hall, and it's only about internally about five meters. Okay, and the and the accelerator, the beam line, is at a height. It is at 1.75 meters. It is not here. It is here. Okay, the reason being that you want equipment to keep, come underneath, and you also want space to go from this side to that side. So it is always kept at high. So the beam line is actually 1.75 meters in height 
and the hall is only seven meters or five meters. So you have to lift everything, equipment, and bring it. So the whole thing was even from the headroom outside was crunched. So that also we had to cheat a little bit, quite a bit. Okay. And the tunnel was even shorter. So we could not put a quarter of a cavity here. Hmm. Okay. So we had to put a small cavity. So hence we had to hence we had to buy a what uh, uh, what we call a split loop cavity. Hmm. And this was what was used in the Stony Brook Linux. So we bought one from there and we used this. So this is just to show you the cavity with before lead plating and after lead plating. And we use this to create bunches which are now accelerated through the LNAC. Okay. How do I bunch a beam? It's very easy actually. If you're driving on marine drive, you will find that when you start, all, all of us are at different speeds. Huh. So the guy who's faster catches up with the slower chap. So by the time you reach your party, we are all in one bunch. All the slow guys slow down, all the fast guys coming from behind, and everybody is in a bunch. It happens naturally. What you need to do is modulate velocity. Huh. So you take a chunk of DC beam. The guys who come early, you make them slow. Huh. And the guys who come late, you make them fast and let them go down marine drive. And by the time they reach over, they will be in a nice bunch. Okay, that's how you bunch it. Huh. But the, the linear cavity is operated at 150 megahertz. So the time period is only 6.6 .6 nanoseconds. And you want to find yourself close to the crest. So the beam dynamics tells me that the bunch should be of the order of 100 to 200 picoseconds. Okay. Hmm. So, so, so I have to modulate this velocity so that I can do the bunching and they'll catch up together. But this modulation is of the order of 1% of the, the, the mean beam energy. So if I have a mean beam energy coming from the peloton, which is after 100 MeV, then I need 1 MeV modulation back and forth on the beam to be able to do this crunching to 100 picoseconds. Okay. Now, to generate a 1 MeV acceleration requires me to use a superconducting cavity. I can't do it by room temperature cavity. So that is why we use this cavity. So we call this the super buncher. So it's a superconducting buncher cavity. So it bunches the beam and makes it into 100 to 200 picoseconds. Hmm. Okay. And then I have to sh shoot it through the accelerator. So I write the crest of every cavity as I'm going along. Hmm. And then I come to the mid bend of the Linac. Okay. Because I have to turn around and, and come out parallel to the sea. Okay. So we come to the mid bend. Now the mid bend is a very complicated beast. Hmm. It has many magnets, many elements, vacuum systems, power supplies, water cooling, all kinds of things. Hmm. Okay. And a bending magnet is nasty business. Now I have modulated the velocity. I have modulated the velocity so that it is about 1 MeV on a 100 MeV beam. I send it to a magnet. A magnet, uh, high energy, the simple low energy that way. It will disperse everything. So everything will be lost. Huh. Even if I have a monochromatic, if I come in uh, and I come with the magnetic on a benched beam, I come with a benched beam all at the same time and monochromatic. Huh. So that there should not be any variation. But when I go to the some people go this way, some people go that way, they take different orbits. Okay. So when I end this on the magnet, the bunch will get spread out in time. Huh. So, so I have to make the bend isochronous and achromatic. And that is why it requires this two pairs of magnets. So the first, first magnet does damage, second magnet undamages. Okay. And so if you look at all the high energy uh, uh, magnets, synchrotrons, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's see, everywhere, every corner will always be pair of magnetic lenses so that the first magnet damages, second magnet undamages. So that you can, it's a mirror symmetric bend corner. Okay. So that is why we end up by being this huge uh, magnets, pair of magnets is a lot of things. So you not only have to make it uh, chromatic and isochronous across the bend, you also want to have unit magnification because I left the first half of the element and I was put in my number bent. I must go to the second half of the next. So I must have unit magnification. I must also have unit angle magnification so that the beam goes through exactly as if the bend never existed. Okay. Now, this is very complicated, uh, but it's luckily for us, uh, EM theory allows you to do this like it. Uh, uh, so, so you can do so mid, mid, mirror symmetric bending magnet. So, this we have to design and also crunch it so that it does not occupy too much space. So if you were in RR the general space, the Linux, the bend itself would have been 15 plus 15 meters. Huh. Huh. But we had to crunch it to something like maybe three meters by three meters. Hmm. So it was all very complicated. So, so this we had to, so we cursed Sharmaji and Devari and all for building a hall, which was the most unsuitable. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> the, the, so the next step was to cool everything down. 
Hmm. So we bought, so initially, as I said, we tested it with the 14 ton, which was discarded by the LTF. Then later, we bought our own machine. Hmm. So this was bought from Switzerland. Uh, so it, it's, it's the make is Linde. So the Germans, Linde multinational had already taken over what was called Susas in, in uh, Switzerland. Hmm. So we bought this, so we bought this, we placed the order in 1998. Huh. <clears throat> and once it came, we started using it for the Linux. Hmm. Hmm. But in between, about 10 years down the line, after we bought it, the uh, LTO bought a new machine, which we mentioned, 80 liters per hour. But if you go and look at that machine, it was vastly different from other machine which we had, because technology had evolved quite a bit in the 10 years. So then I told the manufacturers, I also want to upgrade my machine. Huh. They just send it back to Switzerland. I said, nothing doing. What's the under? Huh. It's inside the hall. We cannot take it out and send it to Switzerland. You send me all the goodies, we'll do it. They were most reluctant. They said, well, I mean, lousy technology in India. So nothing doing. You send it. Uh, we'll, we'll, so we opened the cold mosque, hacked everything. So by then, the cost of the machine was something like 12 crores. But we were brave enough to open it, do it, and then retrofit it back. Huh. Nobody will dare to do such a thing. Well, the machine you cut open and do it. Huh. So we did it and we upgraded this machine so that it became same technology as the LTF machine. Okay. So now, now the cryogenics becomes is completely stable. You turn it on and you can don't have to pay attention till a power failure hits you. And when you run the Linux, as one will tell you, when the relax is running, they'll invisibly a power failure. It also has to be transported. So all this transport lines for the liquid helium, liquid nitrogen, everything was made in situ in by our workshop people. Hmm. Okay. Then we also have to control these cavities. As I mentioned, the Q of these cavities is very, very large, 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9. So when it is oscillating at 150 megahertz, the intrinsic bandwidth is less than a kilohertz. So it's one part in 10 to the 9. Okay, and you have to match all the cavities so that they all operate at the same frequency. So most of our gaddis and all the great difficulty are 10 to the one part and 10 to the six. Huh. And this you have to do one part and 10 to the nine. Okay, so the, the tricks and uh, to do it. So this circuit was developed. Of course, it is not a, it, it's not an invention, but once you develop the circuit using the electronic division at BLC, huh, and it made it, okay. This was also sold by electronic division to uh, USC Delhi and also to Canberra later. Okay, so where they were building their Linux. Okay, so so this was something. So we imported all the components. Very few components we could get from Bharat Electronics. Uh, some RF amplifiers, attenuators, some things we could get, but majority we had to import. Okay, so this was some. It was again a development which we had to do ourselves. Okay, then there were also power amplifiers, but power amplifiers at 150 megahertz we got it made at Bell. Okay. It turns out that 150 megahertz also is a military communication uh, band. So most of the RF thing was sort of auto syllabus for buying. So we had to do a lot of uh, back uh, bending to get these amplifiers made and so. And then you have to have a control system. You have to have a control system to connect everything. So you need a local control system so that you can actually stand in front of things and turn it on. But you're also running it with, as an accelerator from a control room. So you also have to have everything. So this was again developed by the Electronic division and nuclear physics division. And many of the other things like power supplies, uh, cryogenics, all these also had to be dual control from the master control room, from the control room, also from the inside. Okay. So most of these things also were done by, by people from TIFR. Okay. So there was a lot of work to be done, and all this had to be integrated. Now we are trying to do an upgrade of this business so that it looks even better than what is currently operating. Okay. And there are many, many pieces of hardware which we had to make at the TFR workshop. Okay, so these are vacuum systems made at the TFR workshop. These are beam diagnostic equipments made at TFR workshop and later made by a company which is a breakaway from uh, TFR or something called Excel Instruments, so there's a Pi and, uh, and so on. Hmm. Hmm. So, so and then all these beam lines, for example, all these vacuum pipe lines and all that had to be made in the workshop. Hmm. So many of these things, and this is the hall. So we got stuck. We made this part in 2002 and got it operational and we started doing experiments here. So Professor Jao was the director says, you start using it, forget about that, this hall for the time being, because, because of the sea and the change in environmental rules, coastal regulatory zones, huh, this hall, we had to wait because we had to go to Delhi for clearance. So Kuruk and Saha used to keep going to Delhi for clearance and I used to do the donkey work here. Huh. 
<laughs> so, so they finally we got this clearance for building this hall after a five year wait. So once the hall was built, so we made everything. Huh? So by then Vandana also joined. So so she was instrumental in this entire home, the experiment and all the beam lines and all that. This was her responsibility. My responsibility stopped at this wall. So this is the view of the halls when they are uh, populated with experiments. Hmm. So we artificially partitioned this hall using radiation shielding walls into two halls. So that when experiments are going on there, you people can work here. And when people experiments are going on here, people can work there. Okay, So it was artificially segregated by building these walls. And of course, when the building was being built, okay, the civil engineer said nothing doing. You have to tell me where the weight is coming. Now these halls, these are one meter thick concrete things which are about uh, four meters tall. So that's a huge loading. So they wanted to put piling wherever this thing. So we had to think before the building was built, where what will come uh, so that they could put extra piles because BMC is a factor of eight safety. Factor of two safety is more than enough, but, but then factor of two will not work. So another factor of two, and then for the crew, another factor of two. So factor of eight. So, so the, the whole thing had to be designed a thought process well before we could actually implement it okay okay so this is how the linac looks today so the first half which has three cryostats acceleration four cryostats with all the transfer lines and all that which you see the power amplifies uh, power supplies for all kinds of magnets and then the in the distance you can see the super bunch of cavity so this was so this whole thing was by and large made here excepting for the liquefier which we had to purchase okay everything else we either made everything in-house, uh, hard work. Uh, and in fact, uh, most people used to tease us that it will never happen, uh, but we did it. Uh, uh, and so the first half was commissioned in 2002. So in September 2002, actually, uh, we celebrated 20 years of the LINAC. Uh, okay. And the second half was commissioned in uh, five years later, once the hall was built, the new hall was built. Uh, and uh, so, so of course, there are lots of people who helped us. Uh, so in 2000, in 98, when I was, we were busy with the LINAC, Professor Jha made me chairman of the Scientific and Engineering Services Committee, much to my dislike. I said, no, I don't want to do it. He said, no, I'll do it. But that was very helpful because then I could drive the central services and the workshop guys and get my work done at a, at a high priority. <laughs> okay. Of course, uh, there was also stuff, BRC people also, there's a lot of division in BRC also, which helped us. Huh, which And the, all the vendors were also very cooperative. Huh. <clears throat> okay, so this was the inauguration of the thing in the first phase. Huh. So Jha was the director at that time, and Kakodkar was the chairman. Huh. This is Sudha Bhave, who was the JSRD at that time. She was friendly with TIFR. Subsequent JSRDs have become dis decreasingly less friendly with TIFR. Huh. Then, when we inaugurated the full LINAC, it was the chairman was Banerjee and Mustansir was the director. Okay. Huh. And whenever there is a visitors who come to TIFR, that is one beast which is taken uh, for showing. Huh. So you show people the peloton accelerator and the Linux. Hmm. Thank you.